for the call to confession, knowing that God will protect us and gives us strength and love while we persist in falling short of God's glory, love and hope for us. Let us now join together to offer God whose times we need, sorry, let us now join together to offer God those times we need Christ's help to be the people and the church we are called to be. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we so often do the wrong thing. So often do we forget to do the things that we're supposed to do. And Lord, we just seem to find excuses for not doing the things we need to do. And I pray, Father, that you would just uh, help us and forgive us. Forgive us for the times that we thought things that we shouldn't have thought or seen things we shouldn't have seen or heard things we shouldn't have heard or said things we didn't, shouldn't have said. And Father, just cleanse us and purify us from all our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger toward us. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, and as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. For God's will for our life, I'm going to read a few verses from Romans chapter 8. I got this new Bible, it weighs a ton. It's an extra large print, that's why I guess. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now slip down to verse 35, and it says there, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors to him, Jesus, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, this will also be one of our scripture readings, so you'll hear it twice this morning. But uh, it's an important part, and it's good to hear it twice. Maybe we should read it three times. That's, uh, sorry, I'm stuck here. Let's sing together hymn number 214, and then we have the children's story, and then we sing hymn number 497. So, if I love you, Lord, twice, hymn 214. <laughs>
Okay, we're going to do the children's story from here. Oh, you're going to come back. Okay. All right. We're going to pretend that all the people in the audience are children too, okay? All right, today I brought a nice basket of potato chips. Got all different flavors, all different kinds. But I'm going to ask you to stay right there, okay? You can't move. You see your favorite kind? Okay, now you can't move, okay? So how am I going to get those potato chips over to you? I think I can build, I know, I'm going to build a machine, and it's going to have an arm, and it's going to come over, and it's going to give you a bag of chips. Is that going to work? Well, it probably could work, but I don't have time, and I don't know how to build a machine to do that. So, what if I get a whole bunch of ants? You know, the little ants outside? And we'll get a whole bunch of ants to come in, and I'm going to have them come over here and get you a bag of chips. How about if I give you one? That was going to be my next idea. Because the ants, I'd have to go out and find some, and then I'd have to train them, and that's not going to work either. So you're right. I can take the basket and I can bring it over to you, right? All right, now, I just want to tell you that sometimes, and last week I handed out baby bottles, right? And those baby bottles were to help moms and babies that need help. So those were, that's when we become a helping hand. I was a helping hand because I gave you a bag of chips. And there are people all over that just need one helping hand. And that's our job, to be that helping hand. Not to say, I'm not doing that. Those people need our help, okay? And in the Bible, Jesus is the biggest helper, and he's our example. And in Luke, Luke 22, verse 27, it says, out in the world, the master sits at the table and is ser served by his servants, but not here, for I am your servant. And that is what we are called to do, to be servants. Now, we got 40 bottles to fill, not necessarily to fill, to put something in. So it would be really nice if we could fill all 40 of those bottles for people, for moms, for babies. And remember I told you last year that I stopped in to get the bottles and there were a lot of young mothers in there with young ones. And it's so nice to see that they can get counseling, they can get help, those kids are playing together. And I look at those people that volunteer there and they're fighting almost a losing battle. And they're still there. They're still there working with those young mothers. And in some cases, you know, you say, well, you know, the young mothers, it's their own fault. No, it comes from the home. We were all very fortunate that are sitting here to have probably been raised in a Christian home. Those girls, not necessarily. And that's where our helping hands have to come in. So because I've helped you this morning get a bag of chips, right? So you help mommy and daddy fill that bottle, okay? All right. Now we're going to close in prayer. Dear Lord, we come unto you this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for setting such an example for us that we are to follow you and be that helping hand, that servant for you. We ask that you be with all those who aren't here today, Lord, whether it be for illness, maybe they're traveling, and we ask your blessing in the week to come. Amen.
The reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 3, 20 to 21, Hebrews 7, 23 to 25, and Jude 1, 24 to 25. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. The word of our Lord. <laughs> to him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Now all three verses have the word able in it. And uh, all these the three Bible readings. Abel, in the translated from the Greek language, is really denatos, which is related to the word dunamis, which relates to the English word dynamite. So it's, um, it's an interesting word because I looked it up in a dictionary and it has a lot of meanings. It means ability abundance, capability, mighty works, miraculous power, prevailing strength. God is able means that God has the mighty power. He has the mighty power to do miraculous work in abundance and strength. And that's why my sermon is called I'm able, or God is able, I'm able, I'm not able, God is able. And, um, any person who, who doesn't understand God's ability to really do anything that needs to be done, whether on earth or in the universe, of all his creation, he is in, in strength to that. These are the, you know, some people don't believe that. Those are the people that, well, kind of say that it's a lot of, Hogwash. I mean, you cannot have a, a baby born of a virgin. You cannot have a, fi a man in a fish for three days and come out alive. All these kind of things that people find very difficult to believe. But we believe that because we're Christians and we know that nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible with God. So it is the miracles, absolutely. But it's not because it didn't happen. It's because it did happen that it's, it's written in the Bible. So we need to believe that God is able to do anything. You know, some people even question whether Jesus was really risen from the dead. People, he's omnipotent. Omnipotence means that he is in charge of all things and he is able to do all things. Many people today say the miracles that Jesus did are not for today. They're from the apostolic time. They're, that only happened when the apostles were still alive. Well, I know different. And I think some of you know different that have miracles in your own life. How many of you remember Catherine Coleman? Nobody? Jeanette does. I guess. Is anybody here over 70? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Coleman used to be a very famous preacher with a lot of miracles happening during her services, proven miracles. And she started every service that she did, uh, and she did a lot on television in the end. She says, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. 
listen to that, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. And that's the answer right here. If you're wondering why God is able, it is because he is the God of miracles. He is still the God of miracles. You know, I was reading 2 Kings uh, some time ago, and uh, I don't know whether you remember the story. The story is that Zenagarib, who was a king from another country, wrote to Hezekiah, the king of Judah at that time. And I'll read to you what he, what he uh, read, said. He said, in, uh, it's in King nine, 2 Kings 19, verse 10, say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be given in the hands of the king of Assyria. Surely you've heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessor deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezeb, the people of Eden who were in Tel Azar? Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Aphat, Arpad? Where are the kings of Leir, Sapphiraphim, Hena, and Eva? All these kings were overtaken by the Assyrians. And now Hezekiah has said that he would overtake uh, he won't be able to overtake Jerusalem. So what did King Hezekiah do? Well, maybe he strengthened his army. Maybe he got his tanks out and his jets and, and had a general meeting with all his generals and had a Zoom meeting with all the leaders of the church, uh, of the country. But no, he didn't. He did not of any of those things. He, what he did, he took his letter, placed it at the altar in the temple, and prayed. He prayed hard that God would set them free from this, from the strong Assyrian army, that the Assyrian army would not overcome Jerusalem. Now God answered this prayer. If you go down to Kings 19, chapter 35, I'll tell you how he answered it. It says, that night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 of the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the following day, they were all dead, the whole army of dead. Now, an unbeliever would say, that's impossible. That's absolutely impossible. That's more people killed in one night than was killed in the bomb in Hiroshima. But it proves again, people, that all the power of the world cannot compare to the power of God. All the power in the world cannot compare to the power of God. He's able. He is able. You think anything is too hard for God? Well, you better think again. Nothing, absolutely nothing, like I said, is impossible for God. Therefore, he is able to completely save everyone who comes to God. He can completely save everyone that comes to God. No doubt about it. You know, it says in Hebrews 7.25, and we just read it, but I'll read it again. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God to him, which is Jesus Christ, because he allows, uh, he always lives to inherit I have trouble reading this. Uh, maybe I should stand. Maybe God said I need to stand and he'll give me the strength to do that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So, come to God through the, the, him because he always lives to intercede for them. God is always there for us. No matter how deep a person is in sin. Now this is important that you realize that. No matter how deep a person is in sin, he can still be saved. You know, there's a, a person that's very dear to me that has insisted that he has sinned too much for God to allow him to be his son. 
And you know, no matter how I talk, Satan has blinded the eye of the unbeliever, they say. No matter how much I say, how much I said, he just continued to believe that he has sinned and too much for God to forgive him. Paul said, God can and will save him. He said, he came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Who wrote this? The same Paul who was called Saul, who went around killing Christians, stoning, having a stone to death, throwing them in jail. Till one day he was on the road to Damascus and all of a sudden a bright light shined around him and a voice came from heaven. Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And that same Paul, who is now called Paul, was, was he anything that God could not save? He did. He saved them on the road to Damascus and turned them into a great evangelist. The greatest evangelist ever lived was Paul, who wrote many of the epistles. We pray for forgiveness, and he prays, and he hears, and he listens. He has his ear inclined to us. And it says, in the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin in 1 John 1, 7. I'll read it again. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Nobody is too sinful not to be forgiven. So if you think of or you know somebody that feels that, that, is, that they have sinned too much, for God to forgive them, tell them they have no idea what they're talking about because God can always forgive all sins. You know, I remember the first time I was asked to speak at a full gospel wisdom and fellowship in a chapter in London. It was at the Lamplighter Inn, which is now called the Western. And there would be over about 300 people there, so I spent half the night before in prayer, sincere prayer, because I was kind of worried about that. It was the first time I had to speak for a large crowd of people. And I, I just prayed, and then before I got up there, uh, on the platform, the people there, the man there, prayed for me again. And I gave my testimony to 300 some people in that hotel. And I had an altar call and people came forward to accept the Lord as their savior. In 30 some chapters after, all over Ontario's and, and Manitoba, uh, I did the same thing. God allowed me to bring my testimony to 30 some chapters of the Full Gospel Business Fellowship. And every meeting that we were at, we, were, we had seen people saved. People come forward to the, offer the altar and be saved. One time we were in northern uh, Saskatchewan. Can't remember the name of the town. Anyway, we were there, we were doing a testimony, and the lady came, and the man came forward, one of the men came forward, and that his wife later on told me that she has been praying for him for 20 some years for him to accept his, uh, his Lord and Savior as his Savior. And he came forward at that meeting and gave his life to Christ. Not because of me, that's because the Holy Spirit put it in his heart to do so. See, he's able to save sinners. He's able to save all sinners. There was once a man, he was a Muslim. I read about this, it wasn't one of my meetings, but I read about this man that was a Muslim. His parents met millions of dollars in oil. They were rich, called stinking rich. They were multi-millionaires. And he at 21 came forward at a camp meeting, gave his life to Christ. His family disowned him, his friend disowned him. Some people actually tried to kill him. And here's this 21-year-old man that made the decision. And somebody said to him, was it worth it all? He says, yes, it was worth it all. Even if it would have cost me millions more, it still would have been cheap. Yes, God is able to save all who come to him. And that is only one way to accept the Lord as your Savior. And that's by the power of the Holy Spirit, through faith in Jesus Christ, his son. 
Now, I don't know why God put it in my heart to have a salvation message like this for this church, but he put it in my heart to do so. So if there's anyone here that has never accepted the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then this may be just for you. God is not only to save, it will be enough. He's also able to save lives and to change lives. Salvation not only to save you from hell, which is good. And I want to stop you for a minute. You know, there's some churches that are actually now preaching that there is no such thing as hell. It's true. Some churches do not believe that there is a hell. They actually think that hell is the time on earth right now. We live in hell right now. Well, that may be true for some people, but that's not the hell the Bible talks about. The word Sheol is found in the Bible 65 times. It's translated as the pit three times, the grave 31 times, and hell 31 times. So as 60 sometimes in the Bible, it's, it tells you that there is a hell. Believe me, there is a hell. And if we don't go to heaven, we go to hell. There's only one, two ways to go. We either go to heaven or we go to hell. So Jesus not only saves our soul, he also saves our lives. When I accepted Jesus Christ at age 43, I had been going to church all my life, but at age 43, I gave my life to Christ. I went forward, no, I didn't go forward. I, I was visiting with someone, I was praying for someone. I was an elder in the church. And all of a sudden I started to cry. And I think I may have said, tell you this before. I just sobbed and I didn't know why. And I said, Lord Jesus, if you're there, then you better come into my heart, just like that. And from that moment on, people, my life changed. The language that I used to use, I don't use anymore. I didn't use any more three-letter words. I didn't, I didn't use the, the F-bomb anymore. My wife could see the difference because I started spending time with my family, which I wasn't used to doing a lot. And I got more interest in my children and later on my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So my, I became, not perfect by any means, but I became a better person because I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. At age 50, God called me to go to Bible college. Drop everything and go to Bible college, which was a, a real fun time, okay? Billy Graham said, when you come to Christ, the things you once loved, you now hate. And the things you once hated, you now love. People, God is able to take all that is wrong and sinful and change it to all that is pure and good and noble. Let's take a look at, at some other points here about what is God able to do. God is able to keep us from falling, it says in Jude 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and behold your guiltless in the presence of his glory, that one there. God is not just able to save us, change our life. He's always there to keep us from falling. He's able to do that. Some people believe, some churches believe, teach that you can be saved one day and be unsaved the next day. Don't believe that, people. The Bible teaches as much different than that. I want to read you from John chapter 10. I give them eternal life, Jesus said. And they shall never perish, nor one will snatch them out of my hand. Not one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my hand, or out of my Father's hand. And then it says in, in uh, Romans, which we already read, Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, 
neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So once your child or grandchild or yourself has been saved, no matter what happens to the flesh, no matter what happened to their mind, the soul, the spirit belongs to God and it stays there. Nobody can snatch that away from them. If you have children that are presently not serving the Lord, if they have accepted Christ sincerely, then God will bring them back. That's a promise. Your children, grandchildren, who honestly gave their life to Christ, belong to Christ, belong to him. Their mind or the flesh may say differently, but the spirit belongs to God. You know, that's a wonderful thing to think about. A friend of mine lost a child by suicide. And I was able to tell him this, that, that he accepted Christ, that son accepted Christ when Jeanette and I were blueberry picking one time. And I knew that when he accepted Christ, his spirit belonged to God. No matter what he did to the body, no matter what he did to his, to his mind, the soul, the spirit belongs to God. And nobody can snatch that out of their hands. God is able to fill your heart with joy. God is able to fill your heart with joy. Here it says in 1 Peter 1 verse 8, Though, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not know, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Inexpressible joy you have when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, who wrote those words? Peter. The same guy who denied Jesus three times. Three times he denied Jesus. The same guy that, that spent the night sobbing because he did so. That Peter. That Peter now says, this joy is unspeakable, or as it says in the past, inexpressible. When I gave my life to Christ, many people around me say, Peter has gone crazy. <laughs> of course, maybe I was a little bit exuberant, but everybody around me thought I was, I was going wild. Not true, of course, I, I have some smarts. Not a lot, but some but I, I definitely ain't crazy. The life I led before I accepted Jesus, before Jesus in my heart drove me crazy, not after. If you do not have the peace of Christ in your heart right now, there's something wrong. There's something wrong in your relationship with Christ. If you really have a true relationship with the Lord, you have joy in your heart. It may not always show, and joy is not at anything like happiness. Happiness is an up and down thing that, you know, if something goes right, you're happy. If something goes wrong, you're not happy. Not the same with the joy. The joy that God, you have from accepting Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, is a joy that is always there. No matter how you feel, no matter how you look, your lower lip could be help, drawn on your belt buckle, but you're still the joy is in your heart. The joy that says that I will go to heaven when I die. No matter what happens, God is in control. God, that's the kind of joy that you get from accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. He's able to give you that joy, and only him is able to give you that joy. The joy that passes all understanding, that is inexplainable. God is able to use you in his service. I was asked to preach in a church in London a few weeks ago and my first reaction was, no, I, I don't want to do that. I, I'm getting too old for this. I don't want to do this anymore. But then I got to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 to 29. 1 Corinthians 27 to 29. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 
God chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to multiply the thing that are so that no one may boast before him. So here I go in the church, bring my stool with me so I can sit. I preach the word of God. Then really wasn't up to it, but I pre preached the word. <laughs> it's a funny thing happened that the following week the pastor thanked me publicly in the, in the, in the service and people applauded, I was so embarrassed. Was, uh, anyway. I also said that I'm getting old and I have done a lot of work already for the Lord over the years. I've done, I taught Sunday school, I did men's Bible studies, I did preach, I did, went back to college. I've done enough, I'm getting too old. Let somebody else do it now. You ever hear that? You ever think that? You're wrong. If God tells you to do something, he gives you the strength to do it. He gives you the strength to do it. I'm getting old and, and other things that I can't do, I say, please, Lord, help me with this. Got a call to preach in Chatham, Christian Reformed Church, and I said, oh, that's a lot of work, a lot of driving. No, I get, I'm getting old. And Jesus said, no, you're not. No, you're not, young. I'm able to keep you. I'm able to keep you from falling. Hey, I'm standing, you see that? I'm standing. God is able to keep his promises. You know, this Bible, well, your Bible too, of course, but the Bible is full of promises. I don't know if anybody ever took the time to count how many promises are in the Bible, but there is a ton of promises in the Bible. And he's able to keep all those promises. And some of these promises seem to be impossible. But again, nothing is impossible with God. God promised Abraham that a nation would come from his loins. He must have really found that funny when he was 90 or some years old. And here he was 100 years of age and his wife was 90 years of age and she was pregnant expect, expecting a baby. The same that happened to Zechariah and Elizabeth. John the Baptist was born when the way up in the old age. It's kind of scary, isn't it, Jeanette? <laughs> Never mind. <clears throat> you know, one more thing. There was a lady in, in the church that I pastored in Grand Prairie, <clears throat> uh, and I borrowed her Bible one time because I had my Bible, left my Bible somewhere, there, and I wanted to read something. And I saw all these little T's and P's on the, on the, on the side of the, the lettering. And I said, what are those P's and T's? She said, tried and proven. Every time she read something, she prayed for something, she used the Bible a lot for prayer. Every time that she tried something, God proved that he was able to do it and to answer the prayers. God is also able to take us to heaven I'll read here from uh, John <clears throat> chapter six. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose no one of all those who has given me, you have given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. He's take, he can take us to heaven. Our, our life doesn't stop at the grave or at the crematorium. It doesn't, whether you've lived 50 years or 100 years. Your life does not stop at the time you die on this earth. It just starts. It just begins. This life, whether it's 100 years or it's nothing compared to eternity. It's like, a, it's like a sliver of time. Eternity is there waiting for those with Christ that love the Lord. Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. 
dying should be just from like walking from one room into the next. Now you either walk from your room, this earth, into heaven, or you walk into hell. That's the way, simple as that. I, I'm sorry to say that in all the years that we belong to churches, we very seldom hear somebody say that there is a hell, but there is, like I said earlier. The best part starts right there for the believer, right in heaven. Our bodies may die, but our spirit belongs to Christ, as said earlier. So it goes to be with him. And when the time comes that Jesus returns on the clouds to bring us into heaven, or to bring us up in, into well, heaven, I guess, <laughs> he'll give us a new body, a brand new glorified body. When you die, you go to heaven, but you don't get your glorified body till he returns in the clouds. And that glorified body is a lot better than you have now. No matter how beautiful or how healthy you are, what the body, the glorified body you're gonna receive is gonna be a hundred times better than that. <clears throat> I wanna tell you another story before I say amen. There was a, a young lady in New York. Her mother had sold her into prostitution when she was a teenager. She's now 25. She walked outside of a bar completely, completely sick and tired of the life she was forced to live. She was leaning against a post outside. A man that I would call Uncle Charlie walked past her and turned around started talking to her about the wonderful love of Jesus and how Jesus loved her and then sent her to a place where they could look after her for a few until she's better. And she gave her life to Christ. And she used her experience to, to testify to other people all around the city. And many people came to know the Lord. But because of the lifestyle she led before, she gave her life to Christ. She got sick at an early age, and she was dying. And she was on her, <clears throat> she was on her deathbed, and Uncle Charlie came to visit her, and she's laying there dying with a big smile on her face. And she says, oh, Uncle Charlie, soon I am going to be with Jesus, the one who died for me on the cross and save me. And it happened a few days later, she passed with a smile on her face into the internal, into her eternal home, heaven. God can take a poor, broken person and transform that person and take him or her to his home. Think about that. Not only take him to his home, but heaven is the place where God lives. It's a, its habitation. It's also a place where his saints will dwell forever. We can call heaven our home. That does not end at all. The soul continues to live on and for the believer, the soul at death immediately, immediately enters forever into the presence of God. That's a promise. If you try to prove me wrong, see me after, because there's too many Bible passages that will tell you that that's the truth. If we believe in Jesus Christ, if we truly accept him as our Lord and Savior, we will live forever in heaven. And maybe next time here, I'm gonna talk about heaven because it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Some of our people that we know are already there. I know my brother Tom is there. My mom and dad are there. And someday I will go there and I will, I will know him. People say, will you recognize him? Yeah, I think you can. Remember when Peter and, and John were on the mountain of transfiguration and Peter said, Let's make 
tabernacles for uh, Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. He recognized who they were. He had never met them, but he recognized Moses and he had recognized Elijah. So we will also recognize the ones that we love when we get to heaven. My opinion, but I backed it up with the word right there, that just when you go to heaven, you will meet those that have gone before us. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you that you're able. You're such a marvelous God. There's so many things, O oh Lord, that happen in our life that we forget to say thank you for. You bless us with minds that work well, with bodies that go where we want them to go. Every breath that we take, every beat of our heart, Lord, comes from you. And that's because you're able. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that you're able to do all things. Amen. Let's sing together. I think it's time for a song. Oh, we're going to do the Apostles' Creed, please. Sorry. You know, the church that I've been preaching in for, for quite a few years now uh, don't have all this, okay? They, they, they sing, they worship, they preach, and they go home. <laughs> I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that I'm not used to this anymore, so that's why I forget things once in a while. Okay, let's... Uh, <coughs> Let's do the Apostles' Creed again. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the promise of God, was crucified, dead, and buried. Let's pray again. Father in heaven, you know every need in this congregation. And although we have taken time to thank you for the many good things we have, we also have some needs, Lord, and we bring those needs before you. Some of our congregation, Lord, are, are struggling with sickness. And although you've been great and wonderful with your healing power, these people still struggle. And I pray for Elaine, for Glenn, for John, for Dennis, for Marg, for Kath, Katie, and Brenda, and Gary. Father, you, I don't even know them all, but I'm glad that you know them intimately. You are the one that created them. You are the one that knitted them together in their mother's womb, it says in, in Psalms. So you know every need that they have. You know every sick cell in the body, and I ask you, Lord Jesus, would you please remove those cells and replace them with healthy cells. I pray, Father, that you would let your Holy Spirit, healing power, flow through their bodies from the top of their head right down to the bottom of their feet, Lord, and let him heal every physical, emotional, spiritual healing that is needed. 
body, like I said, you know what they need. You know a lot better than I do. But all we can do, Lord, is pray and ask that you would just let your will be done in their lives. And we will give you all the honor and the glory. I pray for the pastor of this church. I thank you for him. I pray, Father, that his time in Drayton may be a blessing to the people in Drayton. And I pray, Father, that you bring him safely home. Thank you, Lord, that there is good weather for driving and that you are on the way with him all the way down back to, to uh, Chatham. So, Lord, just uh, continue to bless this church. Be with the elders and the deacons, Lord. Give them the wisdom that they need to come from heaven above. Not the wisdom of this earth, Lord, not the wisdom of the flesh, but the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ that is pure, peace-loving, kind, full of good fruit, and, Lord, loving and caring. And I pray, Father, for death to be in the hearts of our elders and deacons as they reach out to those of this congregation. I pray for all those, Lord, that could not be here today for whatever reason it may be. Let them be able to get a real blessing. Be with those, O oh Lord, that are listening to us on, online. And I pray, Father, that you would pour out a very special blessing upon them as well. So continue to be near to us. Continue to allow us, O oh Lord, to feel you near to us. That's the way it should be. You're always near to us. But let us feel your nearness. Let us feel your presence. Let us feel the power of your Holy Spirit as we go our individual ways again. Thank you again, Lord, for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I pray that every word that was spoken, Lord, may, that it was according to your will, may ring in the people's heart for time to come. Let them realize, O oh Lord, that you are able, able to do all things, able to keep us from falling and behold us guiltless in the presence of his glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. And everybody said, Amen.
hides before them. Lord, we know that you allow us to keep 90%, and we're so blessed. We have all the food we need. We live in a country, Lord, where, where nothing is, is impossible, and you have given us those finances. You have given us the jobs and the, and the income that we need. And Lord, it's just our, our pleasure to bring our tithes before you. And I pray, Father, that you use these tithes for the furthering of your kingdom through this church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One more time. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and behold the present in the presence of his glory with amazing grace to the only wise God and Savior with glory and majesty forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.